station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, I am ready for the event. People Magazine, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Tom Kniff with People Magazine. How do you hear me? Hello, Tom. I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Good to talk, to you, talk with you again. Yes, good to talk with you again, Tom. Uh, this is this is a first for me. So, uh, but th thank you for doing this. Um, where are you now exactly in the ISS? So right now, I am in the Columbus module, which is the European Space Agency's laboratory module as part of the U.S. operating system on the International Space Station. And what country are you over? Well, when I just checked our map, we are over Australia right now. We spend a lot of time over the ocean, of course, but right now we're over Australia, and it's uh, dark there right now. And so it's nighttime. That's, uh, it gives me a good sense of where you are. Ha! I know you've been up there about a, about a month. How's it going? Well, it's going really great, actually. It's an amazing thing to get to spend this much time in space and really get used to it, start to adapt to the environment and get efficient moving around and uh, living and working in space. It's really been incredible. I, I bet. It's uh, a once-in-a-lifetime experience, obviously. Uh, I know, you know that, uh, that ISS has been on the news this morning with uh, regard to the space debris that, that put a hole through the robotic arm. Can you talk about that a little? So uh, we learned recently that there was a, a strike on the robotic arm that actually turns out was occurred back in February of this year. And uh, just a recent survey brought that to light with some photographs. And the team on the ground has worked very hard uh, to absolve that, to really look in, in detail at what that actually is. And uh, you probably have more detail in the news uh, right now, but what we understand is that the arm is operating completely normally. It has done some significant tasks since it received that hit and uh, is expected to be completely operational for all of the big tasks that we have coming up. And I, and I understand you had to dodge a piece of space debris on your way to, in the Crew Dragon to the space station. Is that true? So we were alerted that there was some debris near our vehicle, and it was a, a kind of what we would call a late notification, meaning that our team uh, found out about it late. So we immediately got into our spacesuits and uh, zipped up so that we would be safe. And then it turned out that it was, in fact, not, uh, there, were, there was not any debris, um, that it was a false alarm. But we, we proved that we could get into our spacesuits really quick. <laughs> so you didn't have to do any, make any maneuvers in order to avoid it. That's correct. Yeah, we just uh, continued on our regular path. Well, tell me a little bit about the, the past month. What's the coolest thing you've seen since you've been up there? Well, Tom, one of the things that I love to do when I have the time is to look out the window. We have several different windows on the International Space Station, and uh, we spend a lot of time over the ocean. And so sometimes you can see these very large thunderstorms out over the ocean. And I saw something recently that I've never seen before, um, which I, I think is, a, is sort of lightning related, but it was actually lightning that came up away from the surface of the Earth. It may have been what scientists call a blue jet. And I don't know a lot about the phenomenon, but I, I came back in and saw some of my crewmates, and I'll, I said, you'll never guess what I just saw. And I described it to them, and they, and they said they thought it was one of these blue jets that's a, you know, a lightning-related phenomenon that's very rare. So it was pretty cool to see it. Wow. <laughs> that, that is very cool. Um, uh, what would you say is the highlight of your mission so far? Well, certainly launch and docking was a big highlight for us. And then once on the International Space Station, I would say that from a science perspective, getting to operate with the Celestial Immunity Project, which is a, a study that looks at immune function and could contribute to developing vaccines back on Earth, that was a real highlight for me, getting to participate. I'm not a biologist by training, and so I had you know a camera over my shoulder with an expert talking me through it every step of the way. And that was very exciting to be so hands-on involved in an important research 
research project like that. We have a launch of a SpaceX cargo vehicle coming up this weekend, bringing 7,000 pounds more science uh, to us. So we're excited to uh, get that here, get it unpacked and get started with all of that. That will include a couple of spacewalks. And so we are preparing for that as well. And I know those are going to be a real highlight too. Wow. Are you expecting any uh, treats from Bob and Theo? Are they sending anything up to you? I think we can expect a care package, and I know the team back home will focus on sending us some fresh food as well, maybe some uh, some citrus, but I expect there'll be some some special care package in there from Bob and Theo as well. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, uh, I know you have, you have a packet of food there with you right now? I do have some food I can show you. Um, we have a, a pretty varied uh, different kinds of food up here that some of it's dehydrated that we have to rehydrate. Some of it has been heated to preserve it, so we just have to reheat it. I'll show you what that different packaging looks like. This is the uh, food that is already hydrated, so we just have to heat it. So it's, it looks similar to the kinds of meals that our soldiers get in the field. This is actually brown mm -hmm. rice in this packet right here. Then I have some uh, dehydrated food in this packet. This outer packet is actually a protective packet to um, keep the, help the food stay shelf stable for a little bit longer. So you actually have to open this outer packet to get at the food inside. Um, so I'll take a quick second to do that. Sure. This is a cashew chicken curry. It's what I'm going to have for my dinner tonight. So you can see that uh -huh. it's dehydrated, and I have to add water in, uh, in through this um, opening here. And then I'll put it in the warming oven for about a half an hour so it gets really nice and rehydrated and warm. Um, so that's, that's pretty nice. We also, of course, have a variety of different drinks. The Food Lab packed me my favorite tea that I turn into iced tea. We do have a teeny tiny refrigerator on board that we can uh, cool off some drinks or small food packets. So they really do uh, take care to try to give us lots of different variety in uh, flavors and textures and, and temperature as well. Uh, but it has to be pretty, it, it can't be, uh, 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 you can't have any crumbs when you're eating, is that right? Well, we do try to minimize crumbs. We don't have a lot of bread up here, but we do have some crackers and cookies that will make crumbs. And then, of course, the liquid food, if you move too fast, you can spray, you can spray little droplets of, of liquid everywhere. So you try to be really careful, and you don't wear your nice shirt to dinner. <laughs> now, what did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, this morning I had, let's see, I had grits with butter and some sausage. Well, that sounds pretty good. Tell me, what is it like viewing the stars from up there? I imagine it's just uh, incredible. This, with, with no light pollution, the stars must look just uh, phenomenal. You know what? They do look phenomenal. Um, very similar, of course. The patterns are the same. We're still just as far away almost as, uh, as uh, you are when you're on Earth. But because you don't have the atmosphere between you and the stars, there isn't that, um, that twinkling that stars will do. And you can really see what color they are. But I'll tell you, a lot of the time when we're looking out at nighttime, we're looking at Earth. We're looking at the city lights and, and we're looking at home. Yeah, I guess that's a little more interesting to you, huh? Yeah, it's, it's nice to think about, uh, you know, the different cities around the world and what people might be doing and, and just think about, hey, what places might I want to visit now that I've seen them going overhead. Yeah. Um, and how, how often do you get to talk, chat with Bob and Theo? I try to speak to them every day, even if it's just for a couple of minutes to say hello. And then once a week, we have a nice video chat where I get to visit with them and we can see one another for about 20 minutes or so, which is really nice. And is, uh, is Theo doing okay? Is he handling the, you know, you're being in space okay? He's doing great. He and his dad are having a ton of fun. Um, he's glad that school is out, and uh, he's loving spending time at the swimming pool. So, yeah, he's doing really well. Oh, good, good. That's good to hear. Um, how does it feel to look at Earth from space? 
Well, I'll tell you what, Tom, we have such a beautiful planet. Really, the, the most overwhelming feeling is one of wonder. Um, even when you're going over the ocean and uh, you just see clouds, all of the different varied patterns of clouds are just beautiful. And you feel, you end up feeling very protective towards the Earth because you see every time we get a sunrise or a sunset, you see that lens of the atmosphere, you know, illuminated and you see how thin it is relative to the size of the Earth and relative to the vast blackness of space. And so you, you sort of feel very very um, protective, very proprietary about, about this special planet that we have. I'm sure. I, uh, I gives you a whole new perspective, I'm sure. Literally. What, what do you spend most of your time on? Well, one of the really cool things about this job is that every day is different, and so we spend time on different things really every day. But kind of two big categories, we spend time doing maintenance, so keeping the space station running and keeping all the science facilities running, and then we spend time doing the actual science. And so those are kind of the two big categories. Um, but like I said, every day is different, so that's what makes it very interesting. We also do have to spend time moving things around because we do keep a lot of equipment on board the space station. So, for example, because we're getting ready to do some spacewalks we had to clear a lot of equipment out of our airlocks which is where the spacewalking crew members will e exit and re-enter the space station and so you can see I have a, a spare spacesuit that we're not going to use in the upcoming walks is been parked here in the Columbus laboratory to get it out of the way so we do spend uh, some of our time every day moving things around and, and looking for the things that we need and what about microgravity have you gotten used to that yet Well, I'll tell you what, it's pretty great. It's a, it's a ton of fun. It's a wonderful way to move around. I feel like I get a little bit better and a little bit more efficient every day. And I, you know, I'm trying off different maneuvers as I, as I take a corner at high speed or changing speed. Um, you want to obviously be careful not to run into anyone else or run into any of the stuff that we have. And we do have a lot of stuff. But it's fun. Uh, it's fun every day. It's fun all the time um, it, working in microgravity. One of the challenges, though, of course, is it, it makes some things very simple. We can, you can move Move things like a spacesuit that's you know hundreds of pounds. I can move it very easily, um, but it also makes other things very difficult. So you have to figure out how to place your body so that if you do need to move a mass and use a lot of force, that you can still do that. So it's got its pluses and minuses for sure. And what about sleeping in microgravity? I, I know you, you sort of have a locker you get into, right? Where you have it's uh, you sort of sleep inside, like the size of a phone booth. Is that correct? That's exactly right. It's about the size of a phone booth for those people who remember what a phone booth is. Um, and it's very quiet. It has some acoustic paneling and you have your own, uh, you have your laptop in there and your sleeping bag is, is tacked to the wall. So uh, sleeping again, pluses and minuses. It's very comfortable in the sense that you're floating. You don't have any weird hot spots as you, know, as you might laying down on earth, but also your brain is wired from your whole life living on earth to feel that sensation of lying down. It's what relaxes you and helps you go to sleep. So I do find it harder to to fall asleep because my brain is not quite programmed uh, yet to fall asleep in microgravity. So it does take me a little bit of extra time. Very, that's fascinating to hear. Um, uh, you know, I did want to, going back to food for one second, I know I read that I, your, your taste, your, your um, taste buds are a bit muted up there in space. Is that correct? So that, that so astronauts enjoy spicier foods for that reason? I have heard that people's tastes will change in space. I don't know that my tastes have changed very much, but the food that we get is very healthy. It's, um, and by that I mean it's very lean and low sodium. So one of our solutions to that is to, uh, to add hot sauce, which is one of the condiments that we have. We do also get um, salt and pepper. We get a whole variety of condiments, ketchup, mustard, garlic, all kinds of things. But one thing that's kind of interesting about the salt and pepper is that it has to come in liquid form because otherwise it would make a huge mess. So I can show you what that looks like. This is sure. actually a bottle of liquid pepper. Sure. So it's been um, pepper that's been dissolved in water. And so you can squirt this into your food packet instead of trying to shake pepper flakes on your food, which would be uh, a big mess. Kind of pointless. Kind of pointless. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that demonstration. Uh, how do you de decompress after a long day? 
Well, uh, if everybody is done around the same time, then we'll often gather around the dinner table in the galley, and we might just eat dinner together and tell stories just like you would um, back on Earth. I'll also, if I'm on my own, I'll, I'll hole up in my crew quarters and I'll read a book. Um, of course, it's nice to look out the window, but if it's daytime outside and I'm trying to wind down to get ready for bed, then I don't want to be looking outside at the bright sun. But there's, there's a lot of other options. We have movies, we have music, we can make phone calls, so there's a lot of uh, ways to wind down. Just like, uh, just like at home. Well, well, you and you now you're you've gone through one month. You have five months left like, uh, up there. Is that right? That's right. It's uh, one month down and and five months to go. But we got a lot of work ahead of us, so we're looking forward to it. And what what in particular do you, will you be focusing on uh, for the rest of your journey? Well, like I said, really every every day, every month is going to be different. I think this next month is going to be extraordinarily busy for us when we get the new cargo vehicle. Um, lots of new science projects that we're going to be working on, as well as the spacewalks, which involves some robotics. And so really that's the horizon that I'm looking at, is that one month ahead of us and everything that we're going to get done in that amount of time. And I think every month is going to have some big event that's happening um, for us to focus on, which is a great way to get through uh, a long period of time like that. Right, and then and you and, and you you have to exercise about two hours a day. Is that right? That's right. We get exercise every day, which is great. We have um, a treadmill, and we also have a stationary bike, and then we have a resistive exercise machine that helps keeps our our, um, our muscles and bones loaded, so we don't um, we don't lose muscle mass or bone mass up here as well. Yes. Yeah. That's. Uh, uh, fascinating to hear, you know, how, how that can happen up there in space. I guess it's obviously the importance of that is for our, uh, for missions to Mars and longer space missions. We, we have to know how, the, how, how to take care of the human body on those long trips coming up. That's right. One of the big things that we do up here, a, a big area of research is what we would call countermeasures. So for the effects of micro G on the human body. So if you're going to go as far as Mars and the trip is going to take a while to get there and you're not going to have an Earth uh, G or even a Mars G the entire time, you need to know how to keep the human body healthy so that when you get out of your spaceship, you can still walk around and do the research on Mars. So that's a big part of what we do up here as well. Very cool. Well, well, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me today, Megan. And uh, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add before I let you go? Just thanks for joining us. Thanks for your interest in what's going on in the International Space Station. We're busy up here every day. So I encourage folks to uh, look us up, get outside and wave as we go overhead. Yeah, they can. Uh, I, I actually have the... Um, you, you can log on to uh, spot the station, I think, uh, .org or .com, and, and get alerts to, uh, to when the station is passing overhead, which uh, I, I have, I've gotten a few of them over the last few weeks, but uh, looking for you up there. But it's been cloudy on the, on the couple of times I've gotten them. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to when I can actually spot you up there. All right, Tom, I hope you keep trying. Don't forget to wave. I will. I sure will, Megan. Thank you so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you to all participants from People Magazine. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.